What's up, everybody? It's Kaz Amazon here with Crash Productions with another episode for the Atari Dev Space. And today we are joined by Herb from LostAstronaut.com. Herb, how are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm glad to have you. So the whole point of these interviews is to pretty much support the independent developer and uh, pretty much advocate for things that you're putting out. So with that in mind, why don't you give the people who are watching a little information about you, what you do, what you've developed for, and what you have planned for the future? Sure. Well, um, you know, I'm with Lost Astronaut Studios uh, at lostastronaut.com. My name is Herb. I am the one-man band. Uh, I do development, sound, uh, you know, art, marketing, everything is done by me, uh, except for the willful help of my fans who who help test the games and my friends, of course. Um, we put out Appaloon 2 for the Atari VCS, mm -hmm. but the company's been around since maybe 2005 or six. I started thinking about starting something. Uh, it's not technically a company. It's not an LLC. It's just a sole proprietorship. But um, that's the way we roll. And, uh, you know, we, I can get into the details of all the things I made before Appaloon 2, but uh, go buy Appaloon 2. It's on the Atari VCS store right now. And uh, we hope to produce some additional titles, which I can get into as well, that are in the Appaloon series okay. for the VCS. Um, even though the future of the VCS seems uncertain, I'm still going to try to produce some titles for the VCS. Uh, not everybody is is uh, confident about that, but I, I do hope to to help the people who did support that console and whoever buys it in the future. So, so that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> so let's go ahead and ask real quick, uh, and we'll get into the whole VCS, the Appaloon series as well uh, here in a moment. But let's go ahead and ask you this particular question: sure. uh, Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the games that you have worked on or have independently produced, and see if we can get a conversation rolling from that? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I, I'll just start at the beginning. Uh, in 1991, I produced with a friend of mine a add-on for the Daiku Mud um, variant of, of, of MUDs. This was the text adventure games that were available on the internet when most people were still on AOL. There were MUDs. Um, you know, there's a history of that. But basically, that was my first foray into making games um that was a pretty successful module it allowed people to create their own levels and areas and weapons and other items for the game while playing the game and this was kind of revolutionary for that particular part of the mud tree because that one didn't really have online editing they only had offline editors right and that was adopted by you know tens of thousands of users over decades um, to the point where it was even stolen and rebranded by other people. But uh, we are, I was the person who created the Isles OLC, which is a Merc Mud mod that was used in, uh, you know, extensively back then. Uh, I wanted to get into gaming. I was working with another friend of mine who since has gone on to work for Bungie and Unity and is now working for one other company. I don't remember. I'll have to look it up. But uh, we made a game that was called future strike it never was completed but we did pitch it to epic back when you could you know write a letter to epic mega games and say i want to make a shareware game uh they rejected it only because it was similar to a title they already had uh i think if we had done more work maybe we could have tried that again but people went to college i was still in high school at the time right people went off to college and in college i made friends with the guys who founded demiurge studios Demiurge is, uh, they made Aliens, Colonial Marines was one of their bigger titles, kind of a flop. They made Brothers in Arms, which was a mediocre World War II game um, where you could control your squad through like directional commands. Uh, and they also worked for a large number of other, like Gearbox and other larger firms, including uh, Epic. They did the Unreal Editor um, documentation as a early contract when that company was forming. Another contingent of the same group of friends went to work for Bethesda. Actually, at the time, I don't know if it was Bethesda, but uh, they worked under Tim King and Fallout 3. Mm -hmm. And I really liked Fallout. And I even talked to Tim King during that period. 
And I had a lot of ideas that I gave him that became parts of Fallout 3. I, I didn't get a credit. I didn't actually work on the source code or the level editing or anything like that. But I am um, immortalized as Herbert Daring Dashwood in the Fallout 3 game. And I'm probably responsible for the use of ham radios in that game. So among other little things that got into that game. Um, so that's that was the closest I got to having a AAA job. I never left Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm based now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was difficult to get people to hire you remotely. Even Stardock has interviewed me multiple times, but they, for some reason, cannot hire people outside of the state of Michigan. So, you know, I've always been operating in Pittsburgh and, and that kind of has kept me out of uh, the, the AAA space. But, uh, you know, I still loved games. I, I wasn't in the gaming market. I sort of left that behind for a while. And in 2005, I thought, you know, I really want to get back into graphics. I haven't fully mastered OpenGL at the time. And I wanted to, you know, prove myself. I mean, my friends had all gone on to these, uh, you know, I have a friend who was the lead developer of Midnight Club Racing, uh, worked for, at the time it was called Angel Studios, which became Rockstar San Diego. Uh, but I wasn't involved and I wanted to be. I even pitched a game to EA that became a game called Herbs Sims in the City, which was basically my idea. <laughs> came off my resume, you know, uh, but I didn't work for them at that time. And uh, so by 2006, I was like, you know, I'm going to make a little Starflight clone. I, Starflight is an EA game from 1984. Mm -hmm. It was uh, one of the big influential games for me. Uh, it was the number one game of like 1984 or 1983, one of the two years. Nice. And uh, I loved that game. And I thought, well, I could make that today. And I sort of embarked on that journey for about seven years. Uh, and in about 2012 or so, after trying things with marketing for Empire in the Sky, which was the working title for that, um, I realized that I probably couldn't do that much alone. It was a classic indie mistake of deciding to do something that was probably more than you could handle as a lone developer. I, I thought I would build a team. I thought I would make money off of the multiplayer aspects, but it, it wasn't as tough as it is today, but uh, it was still tough. And, and I had worked on a game called uh, Sour Broughton. And of course, while I'm starting my company, I'm watching my, uh, Minecraft become big, which was basically Sour Broughton, but with crafting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you're always sort of, or for me, I'm always in to these trends, but it's, it's hard to follow um, a company that has, you know, multiple people or more funding. Uh, anyway, after uh, Empire in the Sky sort of ended uh, and I paused it and you can see that on IndieDB. DB. Um, I, I, I still didn't want to give up and I learned Game Maker and created a game quickly. Uh, or I tried to create that game's prequel in Game Maker. That also failed, bit off more than I could chew there. Uh, but I did eventually take some of the elements of these two games and incorporate them into a game called Appaloon, okay. which was released on Steam it didn't take me long to make it because I had all of that uh, work that was already completed. Uh, but, you know, I released it on Steam to, uh, you know, uh, silence basically. And uh, I kind of had given up at that point. Like I didn't, I had a job, I worked in graphics. That part had worked out for me. The learning of graphics, the application of these, of, of learning C++ deeply uh, was, was my, my day job. Uh, I worked as uh, Poser, the lead uh, developer of Poser, which is this 3D uh, character creation tool that was a pioneer at one point, but it was like a 30-year-old program by the time I got a hold of it. But uh, And now I work in uh, sort of serious gaming, which is the aspect of the gaming industry that deals with military simulation for defense contractors. And nice. defense agencies. Yeah. So that's what I do now. But, you know, Apple and two came out of that sort of background. If you don't mind me asking, and this is going to be a very bold question, and this is also coming from my own level of curiosity. So if this question infuriates anybody, I apologize. Okay. Obviously, independent development, you know, there's always going to be, you know, ups and downs, no matter what field you go into or how you decide to plan it. The question I want to ask, are do you feel proud of the accomplishments that you make? Do you feel like you could be doing something more? Are you looking for that next big thing to throw out there that's really gonna awe the audience and so on? 
how, how do you feel about your successes over the last few uh, decades? Yeah, so it's, it's whittled back a little bit. The honest answer, and I'm pretty transparent, I'll, I'll tell it like it is. I mean, the, the honest answer is that uh, a lot of the ambitions I had with the first project, Empire in the Sky, I have given up because I realized that it's not possible for me to do them. Uh, and that's sort of a maturing process where you sort of realize that you're not going to be able to make, I mean, it's certainly a great game and I have a lot of successes in that and I'm happy with that. And I wrote an engine and I released it and you know, other people can look at that source code and it's, it's huge and, and, and encompassing. It was the encyclopedia of graphics. I mean, I was trying to do everything I possibly could. Uh, but, you know, I think my current aims are to create, first of all, to continue to cultivate a fan base. I have never been able to really do that. In the very early days, I had a couple of people interested in Empire in the Sky, and it did get a lot of views, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it just didn't pay off because it was never completed. So my current goals today are to, to find projects that are scoped down to something that someone can, can make on their own um, and to leverage the VCS as much as I can. I'm trying to get on Xbox. I'm more of a indie developer now than I, I was during those first 10 years because uh, I, I realized that it takes marketing and a little bit of hustle outside of actually just making a game. It's very rare to get that sort of Dwarf Fortress community. Uh, it's, it's hard to get that going. So uh, I'm very thankful for what little fans I've, I've gained over the years and then the ones that the Atari brought me. This has been the most uh, exposure I've had um, in years, and it, it's great to, to, to see that. I'd like to have a successful title. Yeah. And I can talk about all of that, you know, all the specifics of what that means. But that's my goal is to have a title that at least I'm not looking to break even anymore. <laughs> I do this more as a hobby now than ever. I thought I could make it a career before. Right. But now I'm like, well, I just want to make games that people enjoy. And I think I've done that a little bit with Avalon 2, and I think yes. its sequel will be um hopefully as good if not better i remember when when apple and 2 launched on the vcs uh, and you also did an interview with uh brutally honest gamer which by the way i've watched that it's a pretty good interview um and when when apple and 2 launched on the vcs there were a lot of people who kind of had like mixed reception for it me being one of them so mm -hmm. both me and, and one of my buddies actually played the game I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I personally am not a fan. But I've never seen this guy so invested in a video game. And we've we've played Call of Duty. We've played Unreal Tournament. I mean, this he was really invested in it. So it's two sides of the, of the coin, right? And so I know when Apple and Two first released, there were a lot of people who were like, "Oh my God, this is pretty good. This is very relaxing. It's very leisure. I enjoy it." You know this. And then you had the other side, of course, that was somewhat on the anti side, if you will. But I do know that in regards to Apple and Two, you do have a, a bit of a following in the VCS community, and I think that's a pretty big deal, especially as independent. I'm so sorry, my Discord. Keeps that's okay. Up. Well, I mean, uh, we can get into maybe why you didn't like it, but. Uh, you know, I, I do appreciate that. It, I think it is to the people who get it. Um, it is interesting. So we can get into why you don't like it. And I'd like to learn more about that. And I think that that's important. I probably won't agree with everything, but you know, it's to each their own with these kinds of things. Like if you remember the game Worms, um, I was hoping to create that kind of a, a feeling or uh, that was definitely an inspiration for this a little bit. I mean, you have this multiplayer aspect, which I don't think a lot of games explore. Mainly games are, you know, either network play or um, just single player experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So your network play on most games is competitive or occasionally you'll see a co-op title. But I wanted this to be, I mean, especially for the Atari VCS, which is this throwback sort of um, retro console, sort of. Um, I wanted to, to take advantage of that. And I think that there's... There's something to be said for a game that uh, an, an adult can play with their kid. And that's something that I wanted and it, it did work out. Mm -hmm. um, but not everybody has the, I, I knew the game would be controversial and that's okay with me. I think that the problem with going out and making like Apple 3, for example, is not going to be like this at all. It's more of a turn-based game reminiscent of XCOM. And I think you're going to see it's going to be a harder road in a way because people have expectations. Mm -hmm. 
And if you break those expectations, it's not familiar. And the first thing that people think is, I don't like this game or I don't get it. And it's frustrating. But some of the best games have been frustrating, like Rogue, like text-based Rogue, for example. Um, games of that vein ha- were built on frustration. Um, I'm not looking to frustrate users, so I'm glad that it's a little bit easier to play Apple into now than it was mm-hmm. when I brought it to them. When, when Davpa and some of the other people who pre-test the games uh, gave their feedback, I think Davpa made it way easier than I had ever intended. Right. Uh, with his demands. But, you know, at some level, I, I don't, I'm not here to please 100% of the people, but if I could even please 20% of the people, I would be successful. Um, and I'd love to hear your feedback as to why it wasn't for you, because, so, you know, I can dispel any myths and then we can get into that. So it's actually, it actually has nothing really to do per se with the way that the game plays or anything at all like that. So uh, a lot of my gameplay ability comes down to adventure and comes down to, you know, certain types of graphics. And, and there's, there's certain things specifically that grabs my attention. That's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, I'm used to kind of like getting like the reward system, like, you know, go shoot this guy, get a perk, you know, go go collect this item in this platformer, you know, get a perk, you know, it's like leading up to something more. And Apple in two for me feels more like a simulation, which I think was the goal. Am I correct on that? To kind some of like, a, like a grab because it's a gravity simulation is what it feels like. And I'm not particularly a fan of games where the controls combat against your movements. And that's really what it comes down to. I think that graphically it's great. In fact, I wouldn't have seen half of the graphics if, for my, if not for my buddy Barker, because uh, he had all these aliens coming in and items crashing and stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is starting to look a little bit interesting. And I will admit, I did go back and play it. But even when I went back to play it, it just, it wasn't for me. Did you play it in the same room with him or did you? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's probably where a lot of the... Um focus was while developing it was that I would bring friends over and have them test it with me or get my wife to help or whatever it would be. Um, and it is a party game, um, which is on the VCS. I mean, nobody makes an eight player game for Steam. It's very rare to see an eight player game. Right. You can do that. Now. And that's when it's, it probably makes the most sense because you're working together or fighting each other by mistake, um, stealing each other's purchases or, you know, from the trader or whatever it would be. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a simulation in that there is a reward system in there. It just may not be obvious uh, in the beginning or when you first play it, you probably won't do very well. You're probably going to die or not get certain aspects of it. It's not that complicated, but if you've never played it before, you don't know. Right. Um, and I'm actually working on an end game right now. There will be one more major update on VCS and some of that I've already put on Steam, but it's the, the part that isn't available yet was a suggestion from a player, you know, Appaloon, I mean, Appaloon could continue to be in, evolved as long as people are giving me suggestions right. and as long as people are buying the game. But since sales have topped off on the VCS and since um, Steam is a whole other beast, uh, there's reasons why it has never taken off there. And I'll get into that briefly by saying you need a certain number of organic reviews that I simply do not have on the steam platform to be seen even though i've done the marketing visibility rounds it's like a one percent conversion just to get to the store page so if and we're talking like tens of thousands of users not millions of users seeing it right so for that reason nobody is buying it playing it talking about it complaining about it and if nobody is doing those things then i'm my mind is on the next project instead but for apple 2 the next update will have a suggested Like somebody said, I need to buy a bar. I want to buy a bar in the game with all the money that you have. And so I've created actually like a six or seven like in-game possibilities there that um, you you need a lot of money. You have to have overcome a lot of the other issues. One of the issues that you're facing in Apple Two is can I get enough or fast enough? Mm -hmm. And if you don't get the chance to buy a um, like a drone, then you'll it'll be an uphill battle for a long time and possibly you'll run out of oxygen. But if you do get the drone, this makes the game extremely easy. And so you're making millions. And this was a way to sort of have you spend the millions and uh, possibly make money while doing that. Um, So there's, there's there's some additional content there. And I don't know if you played it after I did the 12 item upgrade, but there's now over 30 items you can purchase in the game. And some of them are uh, kind of comedic. Like you can, you can cut the cord, right? And if you cut the cord, 
then uh, if you don't have a personal oxygenator, you asphyxiate. <laughs> but if you do have it, you get to go anywhere on the screen now and you've kind of gotten out of that, uh, that simulation you were talking about. I tell you what, I'll give you a promise. I, I will make this promise to you. After this interview, I'm going to go back and I'm going to play Apple and 2 on the Atari VCS. Well, make sure you play it with somebody else, but certainly alone, you can still achieve everything that you could achieve with multiple people. But uh, it's, will, it's a party game, right? I would it's, say this while, while listening to you, you know, in this interview, I appreciate the, you, you seem to have a certain charm about the game. And I appreciate that more than anything, because it's nice to see somebody who's passionate about something that they've produced, you know, um, and having... Having this game out on the VCS, I mean, which, you know, ultimately is like the indie developer's space right now, if they really want to take advantage of it. Uh, how has your reception with the Atari VCS been, not just as the community, but with the hardware as well? So I have some some gripes, but, you know, overall it is, like you said, like it could be, it would it would be great to see that influx of interest. Mm -hmm. And I think it would save the, the console. Do I think that that sort of critical mass is going to happen? No, I think the reviewers didn't get it either. And it's probably a little bit like Apple in 2, where... It was aiming low on purpose and um, people want, you know, the latest, greatest all the time. And it doesn't have to be. I think that's probably the most powerful retro console, but its price point is painful. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a backer, so I got it at whatever discount that meant. And I even went, plus I, you know, I work for a living. I have a pretty good salary. I can afford to, to buy extra controllers and things. But the one problem is that unlike all of the other consoles and the roku and the apple tv and everything else in my house uh, i can't manually configure the ip address on the atari vcs because of that i couldn't do that on the dev kit that they sent me either mm -hmm. and because of that i can't test my game on the vcs so when we initially launched apple Loon 2 there were problems that they had passed in qa i don't know how they passed because they were egregious problems like you could not control your characters uh, I want to I want to call attention to this real quick, and I've interviewed him before on the Atari Dev Space. But I have a buddy's name's Ian Weeks, and on his website for Tukasoft.com, he has a VCS uploader that developers can take advantage of. That makes like getting your game running on the VCS a breeze. Um, basically, he's he's wrote all the footwork for that, so that way you don't have to do all the headway for it. Um, if you're developing a game in Unity, I'm not sure if uh, Apple was developed in Unity, was it? If so, then that will be very beneficial to you. No, but I can look at that. I mean, I'm happy to look at that. Maybe there's some information I can get out of that. But okay. the problem is as simple as I cannot see the Atari VCS on my home network because I cannot set the IP address. And it can see Google, but it can't see the VCS store. And that's a common problem on my home network. It's not a common network, but I have Xfinity and I have a lot of devices connected. So I have multiple routers and switches and there's just a, a variety of reasons why I had to lock down, mainly because of my job. I had to lock down a certain IP address range for my local network. And if I can't set that information, it's going to default to a network that is no longer going. So, and I do see our time limit. It's just coming. Yeah, I just got the notification. I was trying to get rid of it. <laughs> So we are on the last 10 minutes, but um, seeing as we only have 10 minutes left in the interview, let's let's kind of move forward a little bit here. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that there's going to be more in the Apple Loon 2 series. I want to be able to give you an open window to talk about that. Uh, so for the next 10 minutes, the floor is yours. Sure. What um, will on the Atari VCS look out for? Well, so there was, and I, again, I don't know the times of these things yet. I, I do want to do these things and I'm going to, as long as DAVPA and that conduit is available to me, to get games onto the VCS. Obviously the control issues with Apple 2 are solved. Mm -hmm. um, now, I just wanna say one last thing about that in, in yeah. that it is counterintuitive. People, and I, you know, Space Game Junkie, a long time, I thought friend, was very negative about Apple 2 on Steam because of the controls. It's a little bit of a learning curve, but basically the gun, imagine yourself as a spaceship, the little red pistol is the nose of your spaceship. And instead of, forward and backward moving you up and down on the screen it turns or it moves you forward and backward as the gun is the front not the head of the astronaut for example mm -hmm. and left and right turn you this is i know that this is a polarizing thing but it is what you need to have that game exist so you know just be on the watch for that um and and give it a chance figure it out play with it a little bit and, and you'll eventually get it but that's been a turnoff for some people. But all of the actual technical reasons that they, that didn't work have been fixed. So that means that any game that I make now, I can use those controls and that, that, that module in the next games. So 
one thing that I want to do is go back and revisit the original Appaloon game mm -hmm. and then maybe re rebuild or create a new game uh, based on the ideas of that game. That was a bullet hell shooter that was an evolutionary. So you would start fighting just a few enemies and then over a long period of time that would increase. And as you got more kills, it was all based on your number of kills, you would get upgrades to your ship and eventually it would be impossible to continue and then you would die. And that was that game. Okay. Uh, this and it was all randomly generated ships and things like that uh in this uh so i, I plan to revisit that i could just port it but i think i'm going to do something a little more multiplayer there is a second player in that original game which is where the whole tethering came from in all appaloon 2 okay. but that'll be called something like appaloon 1 reloaded or something to that effect or retro loaded whatever it would be um and then uh that's probably a quicker thing to put out but you know i only have so much time because i spend most of my waking hours at a job doing coding for you know my job and so you know it, i can't promise it's in a month or whatever we're not that far out or far into the project yet right uh but that should be fun and it should be more intuitive less controversial um just a fun romp for up to probably four maybe even eight players i don't think a lot of people use the eight player possibility but it is possible with a hub connected to the vcs and third-party controllers for example um uh hopefully it'll focus well so this is an n64 usb knockoff controller it'll work with an xbox on the pc xbox controller um etc cetera, etc cetera. so so that'll be fun hopefully and and i'll get to that but what i've been spending my break on is working on some of the initial work for appaloon 3. appaloon 3 is going to be i always make things a little more complicated than they should be it's going to be two games in one the primary thing that i'm focusing on is a personal desire to make a turn-based strategy game. Okay. But I want to use the same units and the same graphics to make also an arcade mode uh, that will be more like a bullet hell shooter or something to that effect. Um, it takes place on the surface of the moon. Okay. Um, which is probably the most, maybe more appropriate that the name is Appaloon because the second one didn't really deal with the moon so much. And by the way, the term Appaloon means the farthest orbit away from a moon or the farthest distance in an orbit away from the moon. Um, so there's Apogee and there's Apaloon. Okay. And that's where the title comes from. Apaloon 3 is Apaloon 3, the battle for lunar supremacy. And it is a kind of a political commentary on some of the realities I learned about the moon while attempting to get a position at Astrobotic, which is a company here in Pittsburgh that is doing moonshots where they basically have a lander craft and you can buy kilograms on the lander craft and then you can launch things like any commercial venture could launch things that end up on the moon's surface most of the time that's going to be exploratory you know semi-autonomous robotics but you could do anything you could, in fact they they say oh you could put a chess piece on the moon for seven hundred dollars or something like that or stuff like that so I was, while I was trying to get that job or while I was exploring what, whether I even wanted the job, um, uh, it was a graphics related position. So I was excited. They were telling me some things about the moon and I was reading about the moon and I read about the, the lunar agreement or the moon agreement. So like in the early sixties, uh, when we were landing on the moon, a bunch of countries signed the space treaty, which basically said that space is a shared resource. We won't fight in space. We're going to do this for humanity. And it's very kumbaya for the international community. And everybody signed that one. Mm. But then there was the, the Lunar Agreement, which came about in like 1967 or 1969. Or, and I think the last person, the last country to sign it was in 1971. And nobody signed it. And it basically outlawed commercial ventures on the moon. It wanted it to be a scientific, um, again, a shared, it, it would have established a shared body that was international that had to approve anything that happened on the moon because the moon was not owned by any one country, but rather was owned by all of humanity. And again, a kumbaya moment, unfortunately only seven countries or six countries signed it. And none of them were the US, China or Russia. So the idea behind Appaloon 3 is that it's 150 years from now. And since there is no a treaty about the moon, every country is fighting a proxy war on the moon against each other. <laughs> And, uh, and that will be the, the, there will be some surprises in there, but that, that's the basic premise. And it'll be multiplayer, like couch co-op, you can fight each other. Um, and then there'll be the arcade mode where you can sort of like cruise around the moon, shooting things, um, blowing up barrels and that kind of stuff. But so, um, 
So Herb, I don't want to, I don't want to cut you off here, but we are coming up on the last 60 seconds. Uh, so I want to give you enough time to tell people where can they find your games? Where, where can they follow you? Like plug in your information so that people watching this can, can uh, search you up. Sure. Well, I haven't been banned from Twitter, so we are <laughs> at LA game studio. <laughs> um, please follow me there. Cause we don't get a lot of organic follows, uh, but more, and I do post, post things like once in a while there, but if you really want to interact with me and, and learn more and ask questions and help get set up with games or share ideas or, or just share screenshots and high scores, come to our discord. The invite is at our website, lostastronaut.com. Mm -hmm. um, and we're on steam. So you can find Appaloon 2 and Appaloon on steam. You can also find Appaloon 2 for now only uh, on the Atari VCS store. And I hope one day Xbox will stop rejecting <laughs> me and let, let Appaloon 2 be a part of Xbox, but we'll see there. They're kind of anti-indie. We're also trying to get on the Switch, but there's no timeline for that yet. Gotcha. Well, uh, Herb, it was a pleasure talking with you. I want to thank you for taking your you know, time out of your busy schedule to come join us for the Atari Dev Space. And for those of you guys who have been watching, I've been Kaz Denizon with Kraz, Kraz Productions. If you want to see Herb return for another episode, drop a comment down below. Thanks for watching, guys. And Herb, thanks for joining. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you.